All right, so welcome everybody to the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds. We are partnered with the South Central AHEC and our mission statement is there for you to take a look at. Um, as we go ahead and begin here, um, if you could make sure please that um, your microphone is muted. Um, and also if you could remain in, attentive and engaged in the session, if you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat box. And then also towards the end of the session in the chat box, I will be putting in um, the link for you to complete some um, feedback for our presenter today. So if you can help us out with that as well. Um, so this again is the South Texas um, Family Medicine Grand Rounds for today. Um, those who are claiming CME credit, please make sure that you do that before midnight tonight. Um, your code is listed here um, as well as the phone number, but I'll go over here in the next slide. Um, if you have not yet um, registered your account, you want to make sure that you send your email address to the toll-free number listed there. Once you've done that, um, from that point forward, you can then text the word attend and then the activity code for that date, um, which you can see on the screen here. I'll put that also in the chat box here in a minute again, just in case. But for those, just remember to do that before midnight tonight. Um, if you are claiming CME credits, please make sure that you do check periodically, check your transcript at the CME office website listed here. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. We also wanna make sure that those who are AAFP members um, are aware that you can claim credit through the AAFP. Um, that information is listed there, but if you need any assistance, please be sure to let me know. Um, on the next slide here, we just wanna make sure that we do mention that it is our goal to reach these um, nationally established physician core competencies that you see listed. We also just wanna make sure that we do mention that Dr. Moitra has disclosed that he does have stock options and is on the advisory board for FIC e FICE Medical. So I am going to let him go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and he can go ahead and um, we have Dr. Vivek Moitra and I will let him go ahead and, and share his screen. Okay, everyone. Nice to, to virtually meet all of you. And it is my pleasure um, to come to, to speak to you in the family medicine world as an anesthesiologist and as an intensivist. Um, I see myself mostly as a work in progress, although at Columbia, I serve as the division chief of critical care medicine in the Department of Anesthesiology. And while much of my focus is in the acute inpatient setting, I think what we're going to talk about today really applies to all domains of medicine and even maybe uh, outside of the, the traditional world of medicine. We're gonna talk a little bit about crisis management. Just make sure I can advance my slides here. Um, just to review my conflict. Sorry, I'm sorry, you go ahead. I'm sorry. You're good to go. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, I am on the advisory board of a company that measures, uh, that's working on measuring urine output, FIS Medical. So in every hospital, there comes a time when we experience a crisis. In that crisis, people can be shouting, alarms can be blaring, and unfamiliar faces surround us. The stakes can be high, and time matters, because death can be imminent. Our stress levels go up, our hearts race, and the fog of war descends upon us, and elephants are missed. Simply put, we can be in the middle of chaos. As physicians, these crises are often our reality. As healthcare workers, as clinicians, we have to learn how to make sense of this chaos, or even this pandemic. And to improve our performance, I'd like to talk about the critical concepts of Crisis Resource Management, or CRM. CRM has been referred to as the cognitive, social, and personal resource skills that complement technical skills and contribute to safe and efficient task performance. Simply put, CRM encompasses the non-technical skills required for effective teamwork in a crisis situation and includes the domains of teamwork, preparation, 
anticipating a future state, communicating effectively, and making a decision in the heat of the moment. Over the next hour, we'll encounter elephants, a Google project, a hidden gorilla, a complex adaptive system, and a bubble. My hope is that I can make the connections between these entities for you and demonstrate how to apply important non-technical skills when you encounter a crisis. For Nicole, this is my learning objective slide. Over the next hour, there will be one overarching theme, and that theme for teamwork is the theme of situational awareness. Situational awareness, or SA, is formally defined as the perception of elements of the environment within a volume of time and space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their status in the near future. Simply put, situational awareness is really about figuring out what's going on around you in order to make a decision. In 1977, the flight disaster of a KLM flight and a Pan Am flight occurred because a Dutch crew did not challenge the captain's decision to take off. And in conjunction with ambiguous communication, this caused the death of 583 passengers at Tenerife. In 1978, United Airlines flight 173 crashed in Portland, Oregon. After the plane ran, plane ran out of fuel, while the flight crew were troubleshooting and landing gear, were troubleshooting landing gear problems. The National Transportation Safety Board found that the captain's failure to accept input from other crew members, as well as the lack of assertiveness from those crew members contributed to the crash. Seizing this opportunity in crisis, the term cockpit resource management was applied to the process of training pilots to reduce error by making better use of human resources on a flight deck. A report by NASA in 1979 suggested that 70% of airline crashes resulted from human error caused by teamwork failure. Once cockpit resource management included other members of the aviation team, cockpit resource management was renamed crew resource management. And when the principles of crew resource management were applied to high acuity environments such as the operating room, the intensive care unit, the emergency room, and the labor and delivery suite, crew resource management became known as crisis resource management, or CRM. Today, I want us to reflect on whether or not we can learn from the aviation industry and apply lessons learned to our daily practice. Comparisons of aviation and accidents to medicine and patient harm are common yet controversial among clinicians. Analyses from airplane accidents show that failures are frequently related to non-technical and communication skills rather than to technical flying abilities or aircraft malfunctions. Both industries are high-risk environments that require peak individual performance in the settings of resource constraints. Quick decisions need to be made in a crisis, often with incomplete information. But the environments of aviation and healthcare are not the same. And I think it's important to ask ourselves whether or not we are comparing apples to oranges. Adverse events in aviation are rare, highly visible, and subject to exhaustive investigations. On the other hand, healthcare incidents are more common, often not reported, and lack the standardization of quality assurance. In the conversation about parallels between aviation and medicine, we must acknowledge that while planes are built in a standard way, humans are not. This study found that 70% of surgical attendings and 47% of anesthesiologists agreed with the statement, even when fatigued, I perform effectively during critical phases of operations and care. Yet only 26% of pilots agreed with that sentiment. One wonders whether or not fatigue is as big of an issue as we think it may be. Studies of work hour regulations have not found improvements in patient safety. Time of day of an operation has not been associated with improved patient outcome. And so I ask you to reflect on two questions. Does it matter if your favorite surgeon leaves 
in the middle of an operation to rest. Furthermore, would it matter if an anesthesiologist hands off a case in the middle of a liver transplantation? Let's pause for a moment, close our eyes, and imagine that we're in a crisis. With that crisis in mind, I have two questions for you. First, what individual factors do you think affect your own performance? Second, who would you want on your team, especially if the team member, team members do not know each other in a crisis? So let's begin with our first question. What individual factors affect our performance? I'd like to share with you a concept to help us achieve this understanding. Crisis management has historically focused on this concept of a primary survey as the first step of any resuscitation. But before we do that scene safety check, whether it's in the hospital or not, we should take a moment and actually check ourselves as part of a pre-resuscitation ritual. You may be wondering, what does actually checking ourselves mean? And in this context, I believe that checking ourselves is about assessing our physical and cognitive selves before managing a crisis. This idea is part of a survey called the Zero Point Survey, which includes a series of steps to optimize non-clinical processes before an actual primary survey. Before the start of any resuscitation, physical readiness can be assessed via a checklist acronym, I'm SAFE, which considers illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, eating, and elimination. So imagine how your performance would change if you prepared by grabbing a quick snack or going to the restroom a few minutes before a patient entered an acute scenario. Another mnemonic that can help us prepare is HALTS. HALTS outlines how being hungry, angry, late, tired, or stressed can affect complex task performance. In a crisis, preparation is about knowing who you are. And so the acronyms I'm safe and HALTS provide a checklist for physical and mental readiness. There are, however, other individual factors such as cognitive biases, how we think, and expertise level that can impact preparation. A cognitive bias is a distortion in judgment and decision-making. With cognitive biases, we may try to confirm our existing beliefs or forget something that actually happened. Simply put, our cognitive bias is our blind spot. And with this blind spot, we may miss the elephant in the room. Anchoring is an example of a cognitive bias. When we anchor, we lock into a feature of an initial presentation, and then we don't let go of that feature as we learn new information. So a patient may present with chest pain, and we may attribute that pain to a cardiac diagnosis. If we learn that pain is exacerbated by food or lying down, we begin to anchor if we don't consider another possibility, such as the gastrointestinal etiology. Availability bias is a second example of a cognitive bias. In this case, the clinician may recall a particularly dramatic case that's been imprinted in his or her memory and readily available. The clinician may quickly conclude that another patient's presentation corresponds to that case that the clinician had encountered in the past. Attribution bias is a third type of cognitive bias. An attribution error arises from a stereotype. In this situation, the clinician may fail to consider the stereotype may be misleading. So a patient may present with IV drug abuse or substance abuse, and they may present with abdominal pain, and they may be considered a drug seeker rather than a, rather than a patient who has an abdominal aneurysm. Astoundingly, there are almost 200 known biases in existence. And while we may think that our decisions are rational, think of these biases as blind spots that can interfere with decision-making and lead us down an irrational path. Each of us has the potential to bring our own unique cognitive biases to a crisis. And so researchers in decision-making call efforts to reduce cognitive errors and cognitive debiasing and familiarizing yourself with some of these biases is a good first step to avoiding them. Familiarizing is a debiasing technique you can use immediately. 
So you may be wondering, where do these cognitive biases actually come from? Neuroscientists describe two different processing systems for decision-making, also known as the dual process theory model. This model classifies thinking processes as either type one or type two thinking, and these two systems can help us understand how we think and how cognitive biases manifest themselves. Type one thinking is an automatic, unconscious, fast, and emotional path that relies on rules of thumb to make a decision. There are a whole bunch of day-to-day -day activities that operate with type one thinking. Driving, knowing that one plus one equals two, recognizing fear in a person's facial expression. Because decisions are quick and unconscious, they're seldom corrected. Although this type of thinking can be fast and efficient, type one thinking can lead to cognitive biases. Type two thinking, in contrast, does not rely on mood or emotion, but focuses on deliberate, rational, and slow processes. During type two thinking, alternative diagnoses are considered and pretest probabilities are estimated. Experts and novices likely process these systems differently. Experts take their experiences and identify patterns that form the basis for a cognitive shortcut, also known as a heuristic, that allows them to use type one thinking to make a fast decision rather than slowing down to analyze a situation. So our working memory has a finite limit of elements it can manage at one time. For most of us, this number is seven. When a novice encounters a patient who is septic, he or she may process hypotension, volume resuscitation, blood cultures, respiratory failure, vasopressors, and a central line. An expert, in contrast, will combine these elements into the heuristics of sepsis presentation and sepsis management, freeing up their working memory for other tasks. So have you ever watched an experienced clinician walk into a crisis or a room and immediately have a sense of what's going on? That could be type one thinking in action. So we recognize that we can be an expert in some areas and not in others. For example, I may be more comfortable managing a cardiac arrest than managing sepsis. Calling for help is a way to bridge any gaps we may have in our expertise. Now in healthcare, we don't work in this linear world that's explained by simple cause and effect. Very simply, even if we understood the individual parts of a crisis perfectly, we still would not be able to understand the crisis as a whole. This is because we work in what's called a complex adaptive environment. Teams must come together and work together, often at a moment's notice. The elements of a crisis are unpredictable and unplanned. These elements are in dynamic flux, reacting to each other and influencing behavior. The complex adaptive system is characterized by multiple simultaneous feedback loops. One element of the environment can impact another one, and that in turn can feed back to an original trigger. Often this appears like chaos. Now in healthcare, we often have to work with unfamiliar team members at a moment's notice. So to prepare, we have to answer this question, who would you want on your team, especially if team members don't know each other? So many of us may have heard the expression that there is no I in team. And I think the concept is an important one as we try to figure out what makes the perfect team. We need to remember that our team in a crisis will be part of this unpredictable environment that categorizes the complex adaptive system. So let's imagine for a moment that we could choose anyone to be part of the perfect team in a crisis. Who would we pick? Would we pick someone who is intelligent with a high IQ? Would we pick someone who is motivated? Would we pick someone who's extroverted or would we pick someone with experience? Or maybe we would pick someone, we would pick people who always work together. So Google wanted to investigate this question. What makes the perfect team? In their quest to build the perfect team, they began to investigate why certain teams were more successful than others. And what they realized is that the who didn't matter. It didn't matter how smart you were. It didn't matter how much experience you had or the source of your motivation. What mattered is how team members treated each other. Google found that good teams do two things. Number one, members speak in roughly the same proportion of time. There is an equality in the distribution and conversation turn-taking. 
Simply put, one person doesn't dominate the conversation. And number two, good teams have high social sensitivity. In other words, team members were able to tell how other members felt by the tone of their voice, facial expressions, and nonverbal cues. Together, equal conversation plus social sensitivity equals psychological safety. More formally, psychological safety was coined in 1999 by Amy Edmondson as a team climate characterized by interpersonal trust and mutual respect in which people are comfortable being themselves. So I believe that having high social sensitivity facilitates our ability to know the skills, to know the weaknesses, and to know the strengths of unfamiliar team members. Knowing your team is about being curious about team members, and this requires direct and clear language. So let's think about two more questions. First, can you miss elements of a crisis? And second, how do you think ahead and plan effectively? So although we may assume that we can see what we need to see in a crisis, asking ourselves whether or not we are missing elements of a crisis may be a good first step to balancing our attention. I think it's helpful to think about attention as a limited resource that can shift at a moment's notice. We may shift our attention to one particular detail and ignore other parts of a crisis, predisposing us to what's called a fixation error. On the other hand, we may focus on many inputs or stimuli and risk cognitive overload. Our goal is to recognize that attention is a limited resource that needs to be balanced. A fixation error occurs if a junior resident focuses on the placement of an oxygen saturation probe during a hypoxemic event rather than accepting the reality of the situation. In this circumstance, the junior resident is losing situational awareness because of a fixation error. In other words, the resident is not able to comprehend the meaning of what's going on around him or her. A fixation error can occur with procedures, repeated attempts of central line placement at the same site, or laryngoscopies using the same technique can increase the rate of complications. In this study of central lines, the complication rate increased with the number of punctures. It's possible that in these circumstances, the practitioner believes that there's only one way to do the procedure. So think out loud and invite your team to participate in your thinking process for a second check to rebalance and to prevent a fixation error. Balancing attention during a crisis isn't easy. When there are multiple inputs from multiple people, we can reach our limits to pay attention and we may miss the elephant in the room. In this state of chaos, our balance of attention can shift to cognitive overload where we try to process many inputs and stimuli at once. So a study of radiologists were instructed to, to identify the cancerous nodule in this image. 80% of these physicians could not identify the gorilla in the image within their usual reading time. We call this inattentional blindness, where we look without seeing. Perhaps the radiologist's attention was directed to the nodule of the right lung, and the physicians failed to consider that a patient may have more than one problem. Similar to a fixation error state, if our cognitive burden is high, thinking out loud and inviting our team to participate in the decision process can reduce our cognitive overload. To move ahead in a crisis, we will need to anticipate and plan. Anticipating and planning are the strategic framework of crisis resource management. The importance of strategy can be illustrated by a scene from Alice in Wonderland. Alice is looking for directions and encounters a Cheshire cat. She asks, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? Cat says, look, that depends a great deal, a good deal on where you wanna to get to. And Alice responds, I don't much care where. The cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. In our world, a plan A that crumbles could represent a missed intubation, forgetting to establish leadership, the failure to progress in delivery, or the inability to defibrillate a shockable rhythm. By asking, what's my plan B? 
we can propose new solutions such as using a laryngeal mask airway, calling for help, proceeding with the cesarean section, or administering amiodarone. The development of a plan B and even a plan C helps us move from tunnel vision where we may be fixated on how to do something. If we wanna transport a patient from the emergency room to the operating room, our challenge is to anticipate those barriers, such as inadequate blood supply, unavailable staff, or the inability to transport. Each of these barriers has the potential to slow our journey down to a future state. So identifying a worst case scenario or ruling out the most dangerous diagnosis is a cognitive debiasing strategy that forces consideration of an alternative diagnosis. It can prevent acceptance of a diagnosis before it has been verified. But it's important to remember that there can be many worst case scenarios and limiting our management to only one of them may predispose us again to a fixation error or provide a false sense of security if that scenario is not encountered. So instead of ruling out a worst case scenario, I suggest ruling out several worst case scenarios. Ask yourself, what else can this be? This is one of my favorite quotes. This is taken from an anesthesiology textbook and in it, it says, meant is not said, said is not heard, heard is not understood and understood is not done. So close your eyes and try to remember a time when you observed poor communication during any type of crisis. Let's take that experience of yours and ask ourselves three questions. Number one, how do you communicate effectively during the chaos of a crisis? Number two, when do you call for help to make a team stronger? Number three, how do you get everyone participating in a crisis on the same page? George Bernard Shaw said that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. And so let's begin by asking, how do you communicate, how do you communicate effectively? Remember that in a fog of war, as we resuscitate our patient's heart and our patient's brain, we need to resuscitate another organ to clear that fog. And that organ is our own voice and the voice of our teammates. If there's a period of silence during a cardiac arrest resuscitation, Ask your team, what else could we be missing? When our voice is silent, we cannot comprehend. Whether we like it or not, we are actually communicating to our team during silence. Silence by any team member sends a strong message that can be interpreted as agreement or disagreement, support or disinterest, or cooperation, or even contempt. In cases of silence, we cannot learn. At the same time, I want you to be aware of this sterile cockpit rule. This rule prohibits crew members from engaging in non-essential activities when the airplane is below 10,000 feet. The idea here is to limit distractions during takeoff and landing. Crew members can only engage in duties that are required for a safe operation of the flight, and non-essential activities may include interruptions to dis non-essential activities that may include interruptions to discuss lab values of another patient during an intubation or playing music during any type of timeout for a procedure may constitute some type of violation of this rule. One of the challenges we face in a high stakes event is our use of mitigating language to avoid confrontation or to demonstrate respect. Mitigating speech downplays or sugarcoats the meaning of what is said. The trade-off of using mitigating speech can be a sense of confusion. So let's say that you notice a patient in your clinic has become unresponsive and needs chest compressions. What do you say to your team? David, start chest compressions. Well, I think we need to initiate our ACLS protocol. Let's confirm if anyone can feel a pulse. Do you think we should start chest compressions? I think it'd be a good idea to start CPR. Patient's not doing well. Let me give you a few seconds to reflect on that. Each of these responses has a different level of mitigation. There's no mitigation in the statement. The second statement is softer, uses the word we and is less specific. Option C implies that, you know what, we're all in this together. Choice D is a query that concedes that the event manager is not in charge. 
I think it'd be a good idea to start CPR as really a preference. And the last option is the most mitigated statement of them all, the patient's not doing well. Researchers in aviation found that captains were most likely to issue commands and that first officers who were communicating to their bosses overwhelmingly chose hints. Hints in the cockpit, hints in a crisis are the most difficult to understand and the easiest to ignore. Malcolm Gladwell argues that there can be ethnographic cultures that promote mitigated speech. And this culture can be the root cause of plane crashes, particularly in Asian cultures. And so one of the thought provoking questions we need to ask ourselves is whether the culture of healthcare resembles the culture of cockpits in which mitigated speech is used. I believe that there's this irony in what makes effective communication during a crisis. When we're in the fog of war, it may be worth imagining that the event manager or coordinator or leader, if you will, is blindfolded. In many ways, removing one sense can enhance another. This simulation study found that when physician leaders were blindfolded, the team was more likely to ask for help. There was increased communication regarding task completion and changes in vital signs were volunteered sooner. Simply put, the blindfold removed assumptions. One strategy to consider during a crisis is to imagine that the event manager is blindfolded and to use the three C's to communicate to learn. Practicing the three C's means we cite names, we provide clear instructions, and we close the loop. Our goal is to transform how we communicate during a crisis so that all team members can comprehend what's going on. This is how we build situational awareness. And so instead of a dialogue that looks like this, where we ask, will somebody get the defibrillator? We would kick somebody out of the room and say, Jerome, could you get the defibrillator and let me know when the pads are on the patient? In this example, we cite a name, Jerome. We use clear instructions, could you get the defibrillator? And we state how we would like the listener to close the loop once the activity is done. Let me know when the pads are on the patient. Calling for help early is an important but often missed principle of CRM and an effective cognitive devising technique. But we often don't call for help because of fears of criticism among juniors or incapability among seniors. With the potential of a high cognitive burden in a state of chaos, we need to call for help as a debiasing strategy so that we can see the elephant in the room. Researchers at MIT found that successful teams explore outside the team and bring back information. In other words, they ask for help. Communication confined to only the team is not the same as exploring outside the team. Team that's willing to engage with outside members is more likely to ask for help and gain fresh perspectives that may be missing if we are hungry, angry, late, tired, or stressed. During a crisis, we want to encourage exploration to learn. Because bringing in an expert is part of good teamwork. These experts have collected experiences that can help us make a decision to avoid an error that we may be making. Group members who are concentrating on different parts of a task may not have an integrated view of the overall situation. It will be important to know how to share the mental model. A mental model is an understanding of the situation in front of us, the tasks that need to be done, and the resources available. I'm reminded of this short story that was told to me in medical school that illustrates the lack of a shared mental model. A woman driver comes racing around a corner, barely in control. Pig, she shouts at a man driving the other way. You're a pig, he shouts back. The man rounds the corner, hits a pig, and dies. If we don't share the same mental model, despite our best intentions, accidents can happen. I want you to watch this video on teamwork and trust and imagine what would have needed to have been communicated to prevent what you have seen. Fault, and we're just, it'll be an exercise and building trust between one another. So Harrison, if you don't mind going first, uh, step up here on this chair and close your eyes. All right, and then everybody fill in. And we're going to ask you to fall, and then they will catch you. So you have to trust us. I'm going to count to three. 
Just relax and fall. Okay. One, two, three. Yikes. So some people see a young woman with her head turned towards the background in this image, and others see an elderly woman's side profile. A 2018 Australian study found that who you are affects what you see. Interestingly, younger participants saw the younger woman, while older participants saw the elderly woman. What do you see in this picture? It depends. You may see a duck or you may see a rabbit. The duck's beak are also the rabbit's ear or ears. Sharing the mental model is about ensuring that every team member is on the same page. By sharing the mental model, we shift from egocentric management to team-centered management so that every single team member comprehends what's going on. To propose a mental model, ask a team member, what's going on? Do you have any other thoughts? Simply ask, what else? The leader, the coordinator, the manager is inviting a sharing of information so that everyone can learn. Remember, our goal is to transform how we communicate during a crisis so that all team members can comprehend what's going on around us. This is how we build situational awareness. So our military healthcare colleagues developed a system of communication during damage control surgery in Afghanistan. Each surgery begins with the huddle to discuss a plan of action and available resources. The huddle is followed by a snap brief in which the surgeon and anesthesiologist give a brief update of the patient's current state. Situational reports are communicated every 10 minutes to maintain situational awareness. Situational reports or sit rep discuss the timing and duration of surgery, the patient's physiological state, transfusion requirements. And in addition to providing an update, our military healthcare colleagues also report anticipated problems. To have the bubble is an expression used by the Navy. It means that the person has successfully integrated combat status, information from sensors, the ship's position, and the overall status of the weapon system into this overall picture of the ship situation. To have the bubble is really to have situational awareness. But it's important to remember that in a crisis, having the bubble shouldn't be limited to the leader. We need the entire team to have the bubble. So now I want you to consider four more questions. First, how do you organize a team of strangers to function effectively? Second, how do you challenge authority when you don't agree with what's going on around you? Third, how do you create psychological safety on the fly? And finally, how do you quickly acquire or regain situational awareness at a moment's notice? Although we may hope that we know everyone in our personal or work life crises, the reality is that we will often have to work with strangers. And so we need to figure out how do you organize a team of strangers on the fly or even in a pandemic? Amy Edmondson suggests that the answer lies with the verb teaming. Simply put, leading is about teaming. Teaming is teamwork on the fly. It involves coordination and collaboration without the benefit of stable team structures, because many operations like hospitals require a level of staffing flexibility that makes staffing team composition rare. To team is to organize to learn. And leaders do this by asking questions, sharing information, seeking help, experimenting with unproven actions, talking about mistakes, and seeking feedback. In a crisis, there are often multiple leaders. So I wanna challenge a conventional wisdom that focuses on leaders and followers and shift our frame to leaders and leaders. I believe that if we can shift this frame, we will empower every member of the team to speak up and prevent situations where classic followers are waiting for formal leaders to assign roles or make a decision. So consider identifying a team coordinator who allocates leadership roles in a team that respect the chain of command. Leadership allocation is about determining who will lead each task in a crisis, but it's easy to forget to do this when our cognitive burden is high. 
Allocation of leadership is part of organizing to team and it can allow us to see the elephant in the room. Remember, we need to resuscitate our voice and the voices of all of our team members. And so the first action the project coordinator must take is to clearly announce him or herself and his or her role. At the same time, leaders must create an environment that fosters inquiry rather than waiting for others to come forward. Sometimes these roles are clear, other times it's not. For example, both an anesthesiologist and a surgeon could place a central line. In the example of a central line placement that both specialties can perform, an effective leader will see that confusion and preempt. Dr. A, please intubate. Dr. B, place the line. This role allocation can even include a cognitive roadmap. Dr. B, wait for Dr. C to intubate before placing the central line and let me know when you're done. This type of language is direct. So have you ever been in a situation where the event coordinator or team leader has an incorrect mental model or maybe moving the entire group down the wrong direction? So remember, the leader may not be perfect. And in these circumstances, we need to be able to challenge authority. Remember this 1977 flight, a Dutch crew did not challenge the captain's decision to take off. So how do we challenge authority during a crisis? The two challenge rule, which was developed in aviation, can be modified for the medical environment by using an advocacy inquiry technique. The advocacy component is stating your view and inquiry is asking a question to seek information. It's about being curious. Example, I noticed you aren't wearing a mask. Can you let me know what you are thinking? Response, it's part of a new protocol. Challenge number two, okay, I'm worried about your safety. What, what do you think? Response, I think it'll be okay. So high advocacy, high inquiry conversations foster information transfer, two-way communication and learning. I state my views and I inquire into yours. In the airline industry, and sometimes I wish we could think about this in healthcare, if a team member fails to adequately respond to two or more challenges regarding omissions or questionable actions, the individual is assumed to have lost situational awareness. Successful teaming and consequently leading requires that leaders create an environment of psychological safety. If psychological safety exists, members can speak up without fear of being embarrassed, rejected, or punished. Remember that psychological safety is characterized by a team climate, characterized by interpersonal trust and mutual respect in which people are comfortable being themselves. Amy Edmondson clarifies common misconceptions about psychological safety. Psychological safety is not about being nice. Psychological safety is not a personality factor. Psychological safety is not another word for trust. And psychological safety is not about lowering performance standards. So psychological safety is not the same as trust. Trust is about giving others the benefit of the doubt when you take a risk. Psychological safety is different. It's the belief that others will give you the benefit of a doubt, of the doubt when you take a risk. Trust occurs between two individuals. Psychological safety is experienced by a group. So let me highlight this. When one of my team members in the hospital says, I'm experiencing psychological safety, I try to say like, look, that's actually not the frame that we wanna be working in. You can experience trust as an individual, but the question is, is the group experiencing psychological safety? Psychological safety is about honestly admitting your mistakes giving and taking feedback and forgetting any privilege or status. For the leaders on this call, this is important for us to recognize. You've got to admit your mistakes, you've got to give and take feedback, and you've got to forget about your privilege. So we create psychological safety if we are accessible, if we invite participation, if we acknowledge the limits of knowledge, if we hold people accountable for transgressions, if we set boundaries, if we highlight failures as learning opportunities, if we use direct language, and most importantly, if we are willing to display our own fallibility. Now, you may be wondering, well, how does that actually translate into reality, particularly in the heat of a moment? So let's take a look at some examples of dialogue that facilitate psychological safety. Imagine a conversation where team members talk like this. 
This situation is over my head. Don't speak to her like that. It's not okay. If I miss this intubation, I'm gonna need you to take over. Jessica, please start chest compressions now. I missed the diagnosis. Let's reset. Are we missing anything? What can I do for you? What can we learn from that near miss? Although we've discussed situational awareness, I wanna shift gears and talk about what we do if we lose it. Losing situational awareness can happen in our daily lives. So have you ever felt like there wasn't enough time in the day to complete your daily tasks? Have you ever felt run down? Have you ever felt that you continued to work cross things off your to-do list and just weren't getting ahead? So each of these experiences may lead to a loss of situational awareness. Remember that example of that resident who focuses on the placement of that oxygen saturation probe rather than accepting the reality of the situation. In that scenario, the resident's losing situational awareness. We may be unaware that we've lost situational awareness and clues to this loss include feeling confused, uncertain, having tunnel vision, departing from the plan and failing to observe hazards. These clues has a potential remedy via a crisis resource management principle. For example, we can remedy confusion by balancing our attention. Monitoring the environment can protect us from failing to observe hazards. Challenging authority can help us manage both tunnel vision and departures from the plan. The stress we experience affects our physiologic response to crisis, and that response affects our performance. Our heart rate can increase significantly in a crisis. When our heart beats more than 115 beats per minute, fine motor skills, such as placing an IV, begin to deteriorate. However, when our heart rates are between 115 and 145, complex motor skills like intubation or placing a central line are actually at their peak. Cognitive function also peaks in this range. After 145, our ability to perform complex motor skills diminishes, but gross motor skills like chest compressions remain at optimal levels. When our heart rate goes over 175, our capacity for all skilled tasks disintegrates and we can experience catastrophic cognitive physical breakdown. As we experience these physiologic responses to a crisis, we will need to make decisions. Several performance enhancing psychological skills can be implemented as we adapt to environments that make us uncomfortable. Breathing, talking, seeing, and focusing, embodied by the mnemonic, beat the stress fool, are evidence-based techniques to improve performance. Take a deep breath. Talk to yourself with a pep talk. Visualize next steps as part of a mental rehearsal and focus on a trigger word to balance your attention. My trigger word is focus. I want you to think about yours. So during combat operations, Navy SEALs are taught to use box breathing to relax, improve focus, and clear the mind. Let's do it together. Here's how you do it. So breathe in through your nose, filling up your belly for five seconds. I want you to hold that breath. Now you're going to exhale through your mouth for five seconds. Now I want you to hold again for five seconds. So if you go ahead and repeat, that should help lower your stress level. So if you use these and some other mental aids to beat the stress full and avoid cognitive errors, you will help yourself regain situational awareness. So hopefully over the last 50 minutes, I've given you some perspective that the work that we do isn't always limited to technical skills or even relationship skills. As leaders in a crisis, we have to recognize that numerous non-technical skills can affect our performance and that in our world, we are surrounded by a team. I wanna give a shout out to some of my collaborators, David Kessler, Jessica Spellman, and the Center for Teaching and Learning who are instrumental in helping us develop these concepts. And I also wanna thank those with whom I work with who believe in making the uncomfortable comfortable and the value of teaming. And on that note, I will stop sharing and um, we can do questions.
I don't see any in the chat box just yet, but if anybody would like to, please feel free to put those there or even unmute yourself um, and feel free to comment or um, ask a question. Hi, Dr. Moitra. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a quick question as far as um, suggestion for building team psychological safety. Do you have any tips? I think the fastest way to do it is probably to anchor and leverage the concept of displaying fallibility. Um, it's not easy to do. I'll tell you an example of how we can do it even in a non-crisis situation. I share my yearly feedback from trainees, including the negative comments to my entire division publicly. And I do it so for a couple of reasons. One, part of my role as division chief is to try to develop a culture of feedback. And I don't want to be in a position where I'm sort of this holier than thou person who has no room for improvement. And I asked my team to help me. So they sort of said, look, you're intimidating. You need to work on that. And uh, I'll do that on rounds. I might ask our pharmacists. I was like, how did I do? How did I do with my intimidation? And I think by being open with that kind of thing, um, you can start to break down some of the barriers that allow psychological safety to flourish. I do think that being direct and holding people accountable for their actions, which is something we really struggle with in medicine because I think of frankly underdeveloped like HR world um, is also really important. So if some people have a behavior that is sort of like, oh, well, that's just the way they are. And I just, I'm not gonna deal with it. Um, look, they're, they're almost gonna retire now. Like, look, they've been doing this for a really long time or like, what are we gonna do? Like, we have to try to, that kind of stuff hurts psychological safety. And I think getting to the point where we start to hold people accountable is important. I'll give you an example of that. Um, when I have gotten repeated feedback from trainees or other physicians about other physician behavior, I've removed them from certain clinical settings. And I'm like, look, you can't come back in. Like, this is why. And these are, this is, you know, we have a, obviously you don't do that the first time. Like there's a long record in that. And I'm like, here's what you need to do if you want to come back in to this kind of environment. But if you don't do that, then people are like, yeah, well, they can get away with it. And that's what the culture values. And I think I'll give you one other frame to consider. And I heard this on a podcast. And that's this idea of imagine that an alien comes down to your organization and watches your group for one week. And they just watch what everyone does. They don't know what your intent is and they don't know what you feel inside. All they do is watch your actions. And then they go back to their planet and they write down, they're like, these are the values of that organization based on the actions I observed. Your actions are your values. So if you have a person and you're not holding them accountable, that alien's gonna be like, oh, well, they, they think that that's okay. That's their value. They value that behavior. I don't know if that helps. Hopefully, stirs up some ideas. Thank you. I don't know if we have any, anybody else. What was that? Nicole, Nicole this is Dr. Yes. Ramos. I have a quick question for Dr. Moitra. So this is coming from the perspective of the um, increasingly increasing need for interprofessional teams for complex older adults. So the polypharmacy, multiple chronic condition, um, high probability of risk, fall, uh, fall risk. So, you know, we hear, I was just on a webinar yesterday with CMS on uh, the need for interprofessional teams that um, the, the risk for falling or, you know, it should be a, should be integrated into the chronic care model for care of these patients. But, you know, you talk about the feed, you know, the process of feedback to create social um, stability within the interprofessional team. Uh, but 
I've seen, and of course my perspective is from emergency medicine, that the feedback from certain members of the interprofessional team are valued higher than others. So, um, you know, so we're going to have in an interprofessional team, I'm talking about it's not only the primary care, uh, caregiver at the time, at the point of care, but also the, the providers that are going to be involved in the handoff of care, whether it's the hospitalist to inpatient or uh, primary care to follow-up appointments, as well as the occupational therapist, the nutritionist, the health educator, et cetera. I mean, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a challenging personality dynamic that needs to be overcome. But what are your suggestions? Although this seems to be an age old problem. And um, I personally haven't seen it improve. We still have challenges and handoffs of care with these, these specific patients. Um, what are your thoughts? I'm trying to conceptualize um, the challenge that you're you're trying trying to describe. And so if I if I'm off here, let me know. Um, but what I'm hearing is how do you get groups maybe from different disciplines to have a voice at the table in a way in which someone doesn't dominate the conversation? And I think, yes, that is perfect. I, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think part of that is really, you know, there's this expression that culture trumps strategy or culture eats strategy for lunch every day. And I think for healthcare, it is so easy for us at that round table to try to come up with the strategy part, the metric, the here's best practices, here's the guideline. And now we need to hear everyone's perspective. And, and I actually think that's not the right approach. And I think if we continue down that path, we'll continue to encounter the challenges that you're bringing up. And that's because we are not investing in the culture piece that is required to be in place before you can get to the strategy. And what's challenging for healthcare groups is that to do the culture piece takes time at a time in which people are like, no, we need to do something this month and we need to do something in the next three months. And then we need to show that we've made an accomplishment. But I'll give you an example of how you can build culture. So a similar problem we have is central line infections in the hospital. It has nothing to do with ER, ICU, floor, step-down unit, wherever it is. And I'm sort of the, the physician champion of that for the, for the building. And, you know, there are these sort of checklists for central line infection. And I sort of began to think about this in a way of like, well, what's the culture that's preventing or like that's causing our problem to have this, causing us to have an infection problem? And the way we try to tackle that is, is I paired myself up with one of our nurse leaders and we actually for three months bought Starbucks for every nurse physician dyad leadership team for the entire hospital. And we went for three months to their unit and just listened for out of the box reasons why we may be having infections. And we were fairly honest to be like, we don't think the checklist works. And here's why. Now we wanna hear what are we missing? Like what's out there that we may not be thinking of? And I think by doing things like that, you start to build relationships, you get to the root cause of many of your cultures and you don't feel like, mm, um, this is a guideline that's so far removed from our, our, from our daily practice that we can't apply it to what we do. I think that's one sort of strategy to consider. I think strategy number two in that scenario and one that I did when I first took on a leadership role is I, um, we were in this process of doing something with mechanical ventilation. And I told my nurse manager, I was like, look, this, we need to make this better, but neither you nor I should be involved with it. Let's find the most junior people, the people whose potential career could benefit the most from this to develop the protocols and present it to us. And let's just, we empower them. So we are going to get no glory in this. If this is successful, we want none of it. It goes to the most junior person available. And I think, again, there's a humility to that. You have to let it go. You have to turn into coach more than expert. Um, but I think that's another sort of cultural message that you send to the group that things should be done differently. I like that. I mean, I'm a public health person, so... Um, community-engaged research or community-engaged process improvement. 
is something you would have thought that had been in historically in public health, but really it's only become a mainstay in public health practice, maybe in the last two decades. You know, often we made decisions for the population without engaging the population on what works for them. What are they capable of doing in their environment rather than trying to apply a one size fits all. So I often hear, you know, well, let's adopt, you know, the Toyota model or the Chick-fil-A model on um, team building. But, you know, that's an out, that's an, and then, you know, I've, I've seen practices actually bring in team building subject matter experts, but they're from other industries. We really don't have a core of team building SMEs within the medical practice. I think we try to bring them in, but we, but the team building SMEs, if they do include a physician, it's a physician that's not in a, in a, a busy urban practice, you know? And so um, I think you, you brought up some of the, the some of the, the two suggestions that you brought up. I feel it just, we we're doing this in public health and realized 20 years ago that just preaching and talking down rather than an inclusive conversation about a remedy um, is never going to work. I mean, it, it's, it's so luckily public health has not gone backwards, but it's nice to see the opportunity to integrate more public health principles into clinical care. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, with that, I want to thank you, Dr. Moitra, for coming to speak with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, I did put the link in there so we can provide some feedback, but we really appreciate uh, your talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.